I I would say it's it's exactly the opposite actually. I think it's reverse. I think the way it is presented is wrong. I think the ability to thrive in intimacy, an integral part of the of intimacy skills, this ability is inextricab inextricably linked to the capacity to maintain and enforce personal boundaries. In personality disordered patients, both the ability to thrive in intimacy and the capacity to maintain and enforce personal boundaries, both of them are sorely compromised. People with personality disorders don't do intimacy. They can't do intimacy. Even if they are driven to have and to do intimacy, they want intimacy. They desire intimacy. They fantasize about intimacy. There's nothing they want more. They can't. They don't have the necessary skills. And they are compromised by the fact that they don't have personal boundaries. And they don't have personal boundaries because the separation individuation phase in the childhood of people with personality disorder, this phase of separation from the parent and becoming an individual, individuation, was disrupted. The parent breached the child's boundaries, did not allow the child to separate. So the adult, the child turned adult, has the same problem. He or she doesn't have personal boundaries. And how can you have intimacy without personal boundaries? Now, in most literature and many self-styled experts, they get it wrong. They put the cart before the horse. They say that uh, in intimacy, you should have strong personal boundaries. They don't realize that you can't have intimacy without strong personal boundaries. Intimacy, however fleeting, whatever the nature of the intimacy, even if it's merely physical intimacy in a one night stand. All intimacy is a tightrope act. On the one hand, intimacy involves the disclosure of vulnerabilities and the relaxation of firewalls. In, in intimacy, we open ourselves up in full view and we disclose shortcomings, failings, vulnerabilities, soft points, chinks in the armor, we become, we become vulnerable, become exposed. And so this is one major component of, of intimacy. Um, we put up these firewalls, we put up these protections and defenses and fortresses and moats. We put them up to ward, to fend off, to reject unwarranted or coerced, coerced attention. We want to keep out people who try to impose themselves on us with no respect to who we are, what we want, what we don't want, etc., etc. So the first act of intimacy is dismantling these defenses. And this is exactly exposing vulnerability. But on the other hand, real intimacy entails the maintaining of personal autonomy, agency, self-efficacy, independence. In other words, Real intimacy is about separateness, is about being separate from the person you're intimate with. Separate and together. It's like a Venn diagram where you have these two circles and they have an area in common. That area in common is the intimacy. But intimacy maintains the separateness, the autonomy, the independence, the agency, the self-efficacy of its constituents. Intimacy is, is about, is a balancing act between separateness and togetherness, sharing commonalities and having a private life separate from the partner, where the partner sometimes have no access, when without feeling insecure or challenged or damaged somehow or angry. So on the one hand, you open up. It's like opening the borders after COVID. You know, you open up and you allow the intimate partner to come in. But on the other hand, you don't give up on yourself. You don't suspend yourself. You don't become nothing or a nobody. By allowing the other in, you are actually sharing your uniqueness, your separateness. You bring into the bargain that 
which your intimate partner does not have. Your world, people in your world, experiences, memories, things that the other, that your partner does not possess and now has access to. Intimacy is an act of generosity. To attain intimacy, one needs to feel sufficiently secure of one's core identity. There's no intimacy without identity. You need to feel sure of who you are, your self-worth, your self-esteem. You need to have internal regulation and you need to have personal boundaries. You need to feel so safe within your personal boundaries that you don't mind to invite a guest in. You don't feel invaded. You don't feel threatened. You don't feel annulled or annihilated. Or you don't feel that you're absorbed or assimilated. You don't feel that you, if you invite someone in, you're going to disappear because it's going to take over. It's going to body snatch or mind snatch. So only people who are secure of their core identity, self-worth, self-esteem, internal regulation and personal boundaries, only secure people in secure attachment styles, only they do intimacy well. And so the mentally ill, they tend to enmesh, they tend to engulf, they tend to merge and fuse with other people. And as they do it, they disappear into the other person and they expect the other person to disappear into them. Like a chimera, an organism with two heads, a twin flame, a soulmate. So, mentally ill people, on the one hand, disappear into the partner, but on the other hand, terrified by this process of self-annihilation, and rebirth, resurrection, phoenix-like within the partner. Terrified by this process, they push the partner away and they flee, they run away, they escape. And this is known as the approach avoidance repetition compulsion. It's fear of abandonment on the, on the one hand and fear of engulfment, fear of disappearing on the other hand. This dysfunctional attachment style is the outcome of twin contradictory anxieties abandonment or separation anxiety and engulfment or enmeshment anxiety. You know, the young people, I mentioned the young in my lecture, the young people today have, the majority of them, have insecure or dysfunctional attachment styles. They don't know to do intimacy. They don't have relationship skills. They confuse intimacy with engulfment or they confuse intimacy with the threat. They regard it as a threat. Why? Because they've had no other experience except meaningless, emotionless, casual sex. Hookups, nothing else. Majority of them have never been in an intimate relationship. By age 25, they have zero experience at intimacy. What do they have experience in? The opposite of intimacy. Ersatz intimacy, fake intimacy, the one night stand intimacy. In one fifth of the cases, the, the other person, the other party remains anonymous, nameless. It's a stranger picked up in a party. No one knows, you know. And in the majority of these encounters, both parties are drunk, senseless, wasted, drugged. So the young, youth, the generation, the millennials and the Z generation, they have tremendous deficiencies in relationship and intimacy skills because they don't have the chance to experience intimacy in relationships because the code, the sexual script, the romantic script of today is that I'm cool if I'm detached. I'm not clinging. I'm not needy. I don't need you. It's a, it's a form of psychopathic defiance. It's a form of contumaciousness. I don't need anyone. And I just want to use your body for the night and I'm not going to bother you after that because I'm not dependent on you, I'm independent. It's mass psychopathy. The younger generations are technically, clinically psychopathic. I hope I answered your question. I mean, I, I, I'm very pessimistic, very, very pessimistic, the very foundation upon which the species, the existence of a species depends. The very foundation had been undermined tremendously in the last 60 years, tremendously, irreversibly in my view. And it negates our biology. 
it negates a hormonal system. It, our body is built for intimacy, built for relationships, built for procreation, built for togetherness, built for community. We are constructed, we are machines built to be social and loving. And yet, everyone is telling us, academics, I mean, everyone is telling us, telling us love is the outdated. Go for the sex. Don't dare to evoke emotions or attachment in any of this. Be cool. Be empowered. It's a pernicious, toxic message propagated by a pernicious, toxic establishment. No wonder there are conspiracy theories about how the elites want to eradicate the non-elites. It definitely looks like it. I don't think there's any conspiracy. But it's shocking. Shocking what the academic establishment is doing to our young and has done to our young. It's a crime against humanity. Nothing short of that. And yeah, and feminists as well. I agree. Yeah.